It's a privilege for me to be up here and just see the smiling faces and hear the conversations going on and just knowing that you enjoy each other. That's the important thing, but I appreciate your presence tonight. As always, we have this opportunity for Bible study and, and during our summer series, we have an opportunity to not only have questions answered for us, but also to provoke our thinking for a deeper Bible study. And we appreciate Brother Hayes being with us tonight, uh, and he'll be speaking on the topic, why are there so many churches? And Tim will introduce him more uh, appropriately at the time, when that time comes. We want to keep some families in our prayers who have recently lost loved ones. Cynthia Kirby's brother passed away late last night, and we understand that Brother Joe Gillentine's father passed away early this morning. So keep those two family in your prayers. Do what you can to encourage them and uplift them. Uh, bear as much of your burden as you possibly can. Also, Don Allen Riggs will have surgery tomorrow on his vocal cords, so keep him in your prayers as well. Youth, don't forget that the camping and canoe trip is this coming weekend. Uh, if you need more information about that, you can see, uh, see Eric also. That is, Eric, is that yours? Okay. We have so many young people here, I get them confused. But again, visitors, if you're here with us for the first time tonight, we appreciate your presence. Uh, we do want to remind parents with young children that we have an attended nursery and a toddler room, and this is available during all services. Uh, so if we have nothing else, we'll go ahead and begin our worship tonight. We we'll take out a songbook and turn to 414. 414. We'll sing this before our prayer. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere he leads me in this world below. Anywhere Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've made. We thank you for this opportunity we have to come together and worship you. Father, we pray that as we go through this service that we will have our minds focused upon you. Help us to be attentive uh, to Brother Hayes as he delivers a lesson. Pray that his words uh, from your word will prick our hearts, encourage us, help us to know more about your will. And more importantly, help us find ways to shine that light that you have put in us through your Son, brighter to those around us. Father, we pray that you would be with those who are 
sick and, and hurting at this time. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. We pray for the Gillentine and Kirby family that you would grant them peace at this time, this very difficult time that they're dealing with loss. We pray that you would strengthen the families, wrap your arms around them. Father, we pray for Don Allen as he has surgery upcoming. We pray that that will go well, that the doctors and nurses and other professionals attending to him will will do a successful job, but Father, we know that, that overall you are in control and that it's your healing hand that will, that will bring him through. Father, we pray that you would guide those who are going to their classes this evening. We pray that they will learn much and that they too will be uplifted and ready to, to show Jesus to those around them. We pray for everyone who will be going back to school, for our youth and for those going to college, we pray that you will keep them strong, that they will be able to be the lights that they're called to be, that they can be good examples and to not be swept up with the challenges and trials and, and temptations of the world. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Continue our song service with number 162. 162. Tell me the story of Jesus. <clears throat> Let's sing all three. <clears throat> Go ahead and mark number 927 as the song of invitation. 927. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus 
sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings on earth. Tell me the story of Jesus, right on my heart every Glad you're here tonight. Appreciate you coming. It's been a summer full of exploring faith questions on our summer series. It's been a good series so far. And then here in August, we have five more counting tonight, uh, five more studies to dig into God's Word about some questions that people ask from the inside or the outside of faith. And tonight we're going to dig into the question, why are there so many churches? Um, a tough question for a lot of people and then one that quickly follows on its heels, should there be? so many churches. And our speaker tonight, we're happy to have him, is Brother Lavelle Hayes from the East Jackson Church of Christ in Jackson, Tennessee. We're getting our speaker list together. Uh, somebody said, I'd really like us to invite Lavelle Hayes from East Jackson. And he'd been here before, but it had been several years, and we were glad he could make time for us this year. His wife Patricia's with him here tonight. We're glad she can come. Uh, they just passed 22 years there at the East Jackson congregation, and I haven't got to know them very well. But he's got a great reputation as a man of God, and really glad he could be here. He's got degrees from Southwestern and Abilene Christian Colleges. He's got a Doctor of Ministry from Southern Christian University. Uh, he's very well educated and obviously done a great job in ministry. And really looking forward to hearing his thoughts tonight. So we explore a, a difficult topic. Uh, why are there so many churches? Brother Hayes.
certainly thankful to uh, be here tonight. Thank you for this kind invitation to come and to lead in this particular study on this particular topic. Uh, we appreciate uh, the uh, invite, and our prayer is that uh, as you uh, are a blessing to us, that we will be a blessing uh, to you. Uh, our, I want to uh, use as a springboard text for 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and verse number 10, so if you turn your Bible there, we'll read a few verses in just a moment. Uh, we recognize the fact that the nature of the question, the nature of the study, uh, is such that we have to look at some things very succinctly, some things very plainly. Uh, so I want you to know it's not our goal to upset anybody's apple cart, even though every now and then we need our apple cart upset. Uh, Jesus went into the temple and upset some things because there were some things going on that were not according to the will of the Father. So we want you to know that uh, this is presented uh, to uh, discover, it's presented, presented to challenge our thinking. Uh, it's not our intention to be offensive, even though we recognize the fact that when you tell God's truth that sometimes folk won't be happy. Uh, sometimes when you're talking within the church uh, to Christians, amen, walls, uh, then, uh, uh, you know, sometimes Christians don't like to hear the truth. But that doesn't stop the truth from being the truth. So uh, uh, I am Lavelle Hayes. I'm minister of the East Jackson Church of Christ. We've got a website, www.eastjacksoncfc.org. If you feel like you need to contact me, uh, then I certainly invite you to, uh, to do so. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, very familiar passages of Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and beginning with verse 10, I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. And we recognize, at least I recognize, the uh, intent and content of this particular passage of Scripture, but also believe that it has application to what we're going to be talking about tonight. All right. Uh, we, we may have PowerPoint, but we'll, we'll see what's going on there. Uh, my my, my, my uh, subject is, why are there so many churches? And I'm sure that you'd have to agree with me. There we go. That... There are a lot of churches. Okay. There is, are not just a lot of churches. There are an awful lot of churches. According to Mead's Handbook of Denominations, which is really old and outdated in some ways, there are a lot of churches. There are Seventh-day Adventist churches. There are Adventist Christian churches. There are apostolic churches. There are Southern Baptist churches, Free Will Baptist churches, Bible Baptist churches, Buddhist, Nation of Islam, and Mormon churches. There are Roman Catholic churches, Greek Catholic churches, Christian Catholic churches. There are churches of God, Churches of Christ, churches of God in Christ. There are Lutheran churches. There are Presbyterian churches. There are Episcopal churches, Mennonite churches, Jehovah Witness churches, Pentecostal churches. There are African Methodist churches, United Methodist churches, and Reformed churches. There are a lot of churches. And the list goes on and on and on and on. Can we agree that there are an awful lot of churches? There 
are a great many. There is a various multiplicity. There is a countless number. There's a whole bunch. There are a lot of churches. And since there are so many churches, yes, people today are confused. People today are led astray into false ways. People are led to believe that they are saved when they're not. People often find it difficult to find the, the, the Lord's oneness in the Lord's church that we have uh, taught within the word of God. And make no mistake about it, I submit to you that the Lord Jesus Christ only has one church. His will is that all his followers be one, that they be united together in one faith. John 17, 20 and 21, where he prayed that all who believe on him might be one. Ephesians 4 and verse 4, there is one body. Ephesians 2, 16, God's will that Jews and Gentiles be reconciled in one body. What is that body? It's the church. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Colossians 1, 18, the body is the church. The church is the body. Whenever we talk about the body, we're talking about the church. When we talk about the church, we're talking about the bride. We talk about the bride, we're talking about the family. Talk about the family, we're talking about the house. We talk about the house, we're talking about the kingdom. We're talking about that which belongs to Christ. That body, that group of people whom God recognizes as his own. So in the Bible, there is only one. And you know one thing? I have never in my 42 years of living, <laughs> that's the only untruth I hope I'll tell tonight. <laughs> I've never met anybody that would disagree with the fact that in the apostles' day, everybody was in the same. That no various churches or denominations existed. I don't care what their belief is uh, about uh, the things that are present today, I have not met one person who advocates that in the apostles' day that everybody chose what was of their choice or anything like that. But they were all together. In fact, one of the denominational manuals says that uh, in the apostolic time, there was but one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And it goes on to say, but now it is different. Of course, the question we need to ask is, well, who made it different? If God didn't make it different, then my friends, it should not be different. So Jesus promised to only build one, Matthew 16, 18. So there are a lot, there are a lot, there are a lot of churches in this world. But Jesus built, established only one. He died for one. He is married to one. He shed his blood for one. He will save one. He, in the Bible, there is only one body, one church. So why is it that in our world today, we have so many different churches? Well, gleaning some application from the text that I gave you of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, I believe we'll see some things there that help us to answer uh, the question. Again, the scriptures there uh, admonished the, the church to speak the same thing. Speak the same thing. We must uh, be in agreement on what is the unity of the Spirit, Ephesians 4 and 4, that the Bible tells us to endeavor to, to uh, put a lot of effort into. Uh, you know, if we, if we put as much effort into staying together and being unified as we put into being divided, we'd all be able to come together. Amen. You know, the reason my wife and I have been together for 40 something years. Because both of us are of the mindset that we're going to work together to be one. Now, there have been some times along the way where we wondered if we was going to make it. But thanks be to God that we put the effort into being together and being of the same mind with one another. And therefore, we're able to be together now. There is one body and one spirit even as you're calling, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God who's Father of all, above all, and through all, and in you all. A, a, a test. I, I ask people this question often. How many Lords? If they look at the scripture, they say, one Lord. Who's that Lord? Jesus Christ. 
And I say, well, no, there's two lords, and Hayes is one of them. And you know what inevitably that person will do? They'll give me a funny look. They'll say no. They'll laugh. They show me that what I'm saying is absolutely ridiculous. I say, you say there's not two lords? No. How many are there? There's one. Why do you say that? Well, that's what the Bible says. I'll tell you what. Let, let's compromise. If you only want one Lord, let's take these two that I mentioned, mail them together, and say that's one Lord. I've never had a person out of asking over 60-something people that same question. I never had a person say, that's okay. They still say, no, that will not work. All right? So we, we agree. We can't take two different lords or three different lords or 500 different lords and blend them together and say, that's one lord. Well, if we can't do that with uh, the lord, can we do that with God? Can we do that with the body or the church? If it doesn't work with the one Lord, it doesn't work with the one body either, my friends. We must stick to what the Bible has given us. Speak the same thing. Uh, let uh, there be no divisions among you. Uh, we have to admit we are divided. Or at least the religious world is divided. Because come on now, I, I mean no harm. I mean no harm. But if you wear one name and I wear another, I mean, what have you thought would come here tonight? I say, I'm Brother Lavelle Hayes. May I introduce my wife, Patricia Jones? Huh? Now, there's a Jones in the house. Maybe his eyes might have lit up. <laughs> Amen. And if she decided she wanted to be Patricia Jones, well, you know, I'd say, go, go find you a Jones. Let him pay the cost to be the boss. But as long as I is the head of this house, with your permission, of course, <laughs> it's going to be haze. It's going to be haze. So, so when, when, when you wear one name religiously and I wear another, we have to admit we are, not, we are not together. We are divided. If I come to worship and sing a cappella and you come and sing instrumental, we're not together. Come on now. If I come and uh, take communion every Lord's Day. You only take it once a month or once a quarter. You have to admit, we're not together. We are divided. If I come and I say that minister uh, is, is a scriptural term, uh, evangelist is a scriptural term for the preacher, and uh, you call him reverend or father, uh, we have to admit that we are not together. We are divided. And yet the Bible says we ought not to have any divisions among us. God wants us to speak the same thing. And if we speak the same thing, we won't have divisions among us. You know, I talked about some of those times that my wife and I, you know, struggle. You know, when you got, when you got uh, kids, especially when you, like it is these days, they get to be young adults and they're supposed to be gone. <laughs> supposed to got their own job, their own money. And they're still in your house eating your food. H hello, somebody. I guess I'm the only one. <laughs> when mama and I were not speaking the same thing, we could not get together. We could not get together. It's when we were able to come together and deal with that young adult child with us speaking the same thing and that child saw our unity, that we were able to make a difference, not only in our relationship, but in, 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 in their lives. So, why are there so many churches? Well, I see in this text, it's because of man's affinity to several things that we can draw from this text. When I say affinity, I mean man's attraction to man's love for things that man are, is, is drawn to. Uh, we have so many churches because of man's affinity to or attraction to multiplicity. Man has a love for variety. Man likes uh, to have different options available to him. Uh, if you, when it comes to hamburgers, some of you all may be McDonald's fans. Some of you don't like McDonald's. Some of you like Burger King. Some of you don't like Burger King. Some of you like Wendy's. 
Five Guys, or Backyard Burger, or you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, I'm sure if we took a poll here this evening that there would be several different choices as to number one and what's going to be the best hamburger. Uh, in fact, when you pile into the car and you want to go out to eat, y'all can't even agree where you're going to go. <laughs> Hello. And then your wife, your wife, if you're married, your wife puts that test on you. When you ask her, where are we going to go? And she says, it doesn't matter, you choose. You thought she said, it doesn't matter, you choose. No, what she said was, show me that you are aware of my needs and you're aware of my likes and pick a place that you know that I will like. <laughs> but man likes variety. We like variety of hamburgers. We like varieties of cars. You know, you can have all kinds of options. There are all kinds of different cars. There's probably as many car brands as there are uh, churches. You know, there's uh, Mercedes and there's BMW and there's Infiniti and there's Lexus and there's Toyota and there's Ford and there's Chevrolet and on and on and on and on. And all of them seem to be selling cars and making money. Why? Because we like variety. We like to have various choices in various areas of life. Man seems to have this affinity. And it spills over into us uh, trying to follow God to where man will, will come up with, man will teach and advocate different kinds of teachings or different kinds of doctrines and not speak the same thing. You see... Variety is permissible when it comes to hamburgers and cars, but it is not permissible regarding God's teaching or God's doctrine. You remember, Paul talked about that thing in 2 Timothy 4 when he talks about that there's going to be a time when men will not endure what? Sound doctrine. But after their own lust, after their own likes, after their own desires, they're going to heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. In other words, you, you teach what I like, so I go here. And you teach what I like, and I'll go there. And you teach what I like, and I'll go there. Instead of us just teaching what God says and recognize the fact God doesn't adapt his word to our likes. We have to adapt our likes to his word. So, 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 Paul admonished Timothy. I, I left you there uh, in Ephesus. I want, I, there's something I want you to do. I want you to admonish them to teach no other doctrine. So there was only one doctrine taught, and that's why they were together, and that's why there was only one body or one church. Man has many different doctrines, and false doctrines brings divisions. And because of these doctrines, we have to have manuals and disciplines and all of that kind of thing in order to keep straight what man would teach or what our group believes or what our group believes instead of just uh, being able to rightly divide the word of truth and stay with what that says. Each of these religious faiths that I have mentioned are different and they are divided. Why? Because each one has his own unique set of teachings, beliefs, and doctrines. And I mean no harm, but I think this is a fair question. Why is it that Catholics are not together with Baptists? The answer is, are there some things that Baptists follow that Catholics don't agree to? And some things that Catholics teach and follow that Baptists won't agree to? I, I, I believe that, that for the most part, Baptists still practice immersion for baptism, right? And we recognize in Catholicism, that's not the general practice. That just shows us there that one reason that we become divided is because we teach different things about the same thing. And again, I'm not, to brow, I'm not out to browbeat anybody. I'm just asking some questions or pointing out some things for us to think about and, 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 and statements of, 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 of fact. So each one has their own unique set of doctrines and teaching different things about the same thing is not God's way. We can't do that 
and be right with God. We can't, we can't have different beliefs and wear different names and have different churches and be right with God according to the word of God. So one of the reasons uh, that there are so many churches is that man has an affinity to multiplicity. Also, in this text, I see it's because man has an affinity or attraction to men. Uh, men tend to have a tendency to glory in man. You know, uh, you know we're, we're in the midst of, 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 of campaign season to elect the president. Some people are going to vote just based upon the personality of the person, no matter what they say, no matter what they advocate, no matter what they stand for, no matter what they've done. And I'm not putting judgment on one candidate or the other, but sometimes we just make choices just based on the personality of the person running for the office rather than the things that they stand for. Man has a tendency to glory in man. 1 Peter 3 and verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 21, the Bible says there, therefore let no one boast, or King James, glory in man. In the text, I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. I like Apollos. He's an eloquent man, mighty in the scripture. I like Cephas. Cephas, just old country preacher. I like the, the old good old fashioned stories he tells. I, I, you know, it's just, it's just, uh, you know, we, 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 we make these choices. I am of, I am of, and, 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 and I contend that we're doing something very, very similar today. When we say I am of this and I am of that, because it follows a particular way and it follows a particular doctrine. But my friends, uh, the Bible tells us that we are not to think, 1 Corinthians 4, 6, of men above that which is written. So we have to go to the word of God to make our decisions, not on the personalities, because a person can have a great personality and tell you a lie. Hey, man, isn't that what con men and all that are all about? Huh? They, 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 they are about, uh, they are about uh, that, 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 that befriending you. They are about making you feel comfortable so that they can lead you in some direction that you know you don't want to go. So that's not the criteria because we, we have to do is we have to go to the word of God and follow that. So secondly, uh, we have so many churches because man likes man in that we get drawn into the personality or the way that is presented and we don't check out the message to see and make sure that it is the word of God. And then thirdly, I, I, I submit to you that we have so many churches because of man's affinity to metastrapho. Man's affinity to metastrapho. Man's attraction to metastrapho. In Galatians chapter 1, verse uh, 6 and 7, Paul says, I marvel, I'm surprised, I'm shocked that you are so soon removed from him that's called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now understand that. If in Paul's day there were people that perverted the gospel of Christ, don't you think that just as much today, the same thing would be true? They would pervert the gospel of Christ. There's that metastrapho. That, that, that word pervert is from uh, the Greek word, uh, which means to, to alter or change from its original form. To alter or change from its original form. So men have a tendency to alter or change from its original form. And of course, God warned that it happened. God predicted that men would deviate from God's way. And it's important to understand it. It's important to know that. Uh, he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, that the Spirit speaks expressly. In other words, going to make it plain. What's going to make plain? That in the latter time, some shall depart from the faith. Notice, the faith, departure from it. All right? Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience see it as with uh, a hot iron. Uh, they, they're, they're going to deviate from God's word. They're going to begin to teach, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meat. So there, there, there are several, a number of times in the scriptures we are warned 
that watch out, there's going to be some deviations from. Now, if you listen to man today and they say it doesn't matter, there's no such thing as a deviation or departure from the faith. But God's word said, Paul warned the elders from Ephesus there in Miletus, Acts chapter 20. Verse 28 through 30, take heed to yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, I know this. After I leave here, after my departure, grievous wolves are going to come in among you uh, 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 and not sparing the flock. Even among yourselves, even among the elders, the leadership of the Lord's church, men are going to arise speaking perverse things. Now keep note of that. It's going to start within the eldership, within the leadership, the presbytery of the Lord's church. Draw away disciples after them. So does the Bible say men are going to leave God's way? Yes. Over and over again. They're going to turn away from sound doctrine and be turned to fables. They're going to depart from the faith. They're going to give heed to seducing spirits. They're going to draw away disciples after them. And we can see that what God said was going to happen when we look at it biblically and we will look at it historically, we'll see that it happened. Now, much of what I'm about to say from here is based upon several pieces of information. John Moshim, uh, his book, Church History, uh, Churches of Today by L.G. Thompson, Handbook of Denominations in the United States by Frank Meads and a couple of other sources is what I'm drawing on for this information. Because what happens is, is there is a change in the form of government of the church. Uh, in the, in the uh, New Testament or the first century time and in the teaching of the New Testament, each congregation in every city had its own elders uh, or, or bishops. Elders, bishops, pastors, they were, that's the, that's, that's, those are terms that refer to the same office. Every congregation, Corinth, uh, uh, Rome, Jerusalem, Antioch, every congregation, when they went out and preached the gospel, they went back in Acts 14 and they ordained elders in, in all of the churches. Paul wrote to Timothy and gave him uh, qualifications that, that must be followed. We see an example in Philippians 1 where the servants of God, the ministers, where there were bishops or elders where there were deacons, but they were in each local congregation. You did not have uh, an elder or a group of elders overseeing anyone outside of that flock over which God had made them uh, overseers. But uh, as you see highlighted in the uh, PowerPoint, what they began to do is exalt one above the other. I believe it's one of these books that I have here that I'll be mentioning in just a moment uh, that talks about the fact that there were, I think it's the Methodist discipline, where they talk about the fact that in the apostolic days that the terms elder bishop referred to the same office, okay? But they began to talk about that since every group has to have a head, and so they began to go on and talk about from there having a presiding elder. Now what happens is, is this presiding elder becomes elevated above, uh, above the others. And then what happens is, historically, is that these presiding elders, these, these upper echelon elders, these, and what they began to do was elevate uh, it so that elder was here and bishop was there. So they began to, to meet together. They began to make decisions. And then uh, uh, one of the first human creeds that we know about came out of the city of Nicaea in about 325 A.D. But, at, 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 but then they elevated to the point that they began to use the term father, Latin for father, papa, pope. And at the beginning, there were several that were vying for this place or this office at pope until, uh, according to the, uh, to the sources that I have uh, used here, uh, in 606 AD, Boniface III assumed the title of universal pope. Now, understand God had one church. It would exist throughout all ages. What's going to happen? Some are going to depart from the faith. Even among your own selves, among the elders, is going to begin this apostasy. Where does it begin? Within the eldership or the leadership of the Lord's church. And that's when uh, the 
holy apostolic Roman Catholic Church was fully formed and fully born, even though there were a number of things that took place as that began to, uh, began to develop. So uh, the, the Catholicism uh, begins, and, uh, um, you know, at first the, the, the Catholic Church did not use instrumental music in its worship. Uh, I've read that in 670 A.D., one of the popes tried to bring it in, and it caused a problem. Uh, they, they took it out. Uh, and then 1052, uh, they brought it in again, and that caused a problem to where the Greek Orthodox or Greek Catholic Church in, in the United States is called Greek Orthodox Church, was, was, uh, was born. So it's because it, 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 it left, went split off from the Catholic Church, and, and one of the main reasons was the bringing in of the use of the instrument of, uh, into uh, the worship. You may be aware that Martin Luther was a Catholic priest. Uh, until one day, he nailed up his 95 theses on the cathedral door at Wittenberg, Germany. 95 objections he had to some things going on in Catholicism. Of course, they excommunicated him, and uh, uh, as he was out, his followers later adopted the name Luther. Now, understand that Luther and many of these were not intending to start something new. What they saw in Catholicism they knew was not was in the, in the Bible, and their, their intention in some ways was to get back to the original way. It, this, they just didn't get there. Uh, Luther himself is on record as saying, don't call yourself Lutheran. He quotes the same scripture I used tonight, 1 Corinthians 1.10, and taught people, don't call yourselves Lutherans. But after his death, Lutheran was uh, adopted, and uh, uh, the Lutheran church was, was formed. John Calvin came along with his teaching, and the Presbyterian church was formed. Uh, the Baptist church, originally the Baptist church was not called Baptist church because of John the Baptist, according to some Baptist historians that I have consulted. Originally it was called Baptist because of the way they baptized. Catholicism started sprinkling. Many of these denominations, they broke off, continued sprinkling. John Smythe came along in England and said, no, basically, it's supposed to be baptism, immersion. So when they were first organized, it was because of the way that they baptized that they were called uh, Baptists. Uh, and on and on and on it goes. And, and, you know, not to try to misrepresent anybody, I have uh, some documents from some of these uh, churches themselves uh, in the uh, uh, discipline of the Methodist Church uh, in their historical statement on page 7. They <coughs> say that uh, the founder of the Methodist Church was John Wesley. In fact, in Savannah, Georgia, in the middle of the Old Times Square, there is a, a statue of John Wesley. And underneath it is the inscription, Founder of Methodism. I have a pamphlet here from the Presbyterian Church. It uh, states that uh, John Calvin called the father of Presbyterianism. And it goes on to talk about Calvin and how the church started with Calvin and then spread throughout uh, Europe. Uh, I have the uh, uh, manual of the Church of God in Christ. Uh, Elder Charles Harrison Mason, who later became the founder and organizer of the Church of God in Christ. And again, I, I mean no harm. I'm, I'm just reading from a document that I did not produce. So I, I'm, I'm not do this for harm but for us to see what's going on. And we could go on and on and on uh, how the Book of Mormon, how that, in, uh, how that uh, supposedly something was revealed to uh, Moroni in September in 1823. Well, what I want to know is what were people doing before 1823? Uh, so uh, again, that's a, a, a brief synopsis of, 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 of what happened. And then... Uh, even beyond these, we have others today that claim they are non-denominational. Non-denominational. They say that meaning they're not affiliated with one of these other groups. <clears throat> but uh, I believe from a biblical aspect, a denomination has to be anything that's an organization, an institution, a group that the Lord did not authorize and is not following the, the, the word of God as it, it should be. But... 
You know, new ones spring up every day. I drive down the streets in Jackson, and every time I turn around, I'm passing by a building. Got a new sign up. And since the, since the name has already been taken, amen, uh, they got to come up with another name. Uh, Live Life Ministries and, and all of that kind of thing. Well, well that's, not, that's not what the Lord uh, established. So it goes on and on and on and on. And I mean, looking at that, speak the same thing. Let no divisions be among you. Can that possibly be what the Lord was talking about? Can that possibly be what Paul was teaching when he said, let no divisions be among you? I think not. Besides the fact, it wasn't like that. It was not like that. When the apostles taught, when God closed the writing of the scriptures, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. It wasn't. And all we're about in the Lord's church is to, is to follow the Lord's way. Follow the Lord's way. Because we have to listen to the admonitions of the scriptures. In Matthew 7, he compared false teachers to plants. By their fruit, you shall know them. In Matthew 15, in verse 13, Jesus says, Every plant that my heavenly Father did not plant. And if you were to read it, it's in the context of where he was dealing with the scribes and Pharisees and teaching about the fact that their, doc their heart was wrong and their doctrine was wrong. And then he says, Every plant that my Father didn't plant shall be rooted up. Let them alone. In, a, in, the, in the Greek, that, word, that phrase, let them alone, actually means get away from them. Because they be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, they both shall fall into the ditch. So what we are all about in the churches of Christ is to admonish us, let's go back to God's way. God gave us the Bible so we can find it. Right? We, we, can find, we can understand what the will of the Lord is. We can find the Lord's way. God didn't give us the Bible for us to be lost and misguided. He gave it to us to lead us to the light, for the gospel itself is the light. So even when it comes to the, the, the church that Jesus built, and I'm not talking about a building, then what we're about in the churches of Christ, let's find, let's follow God's way. And as we follow God's way, we'll worship God's way. As we follow God's way, we'll be saved God's way. Because in fact, there's no other way to be saved than to be saved God's way. And that is by uh, responding to the gospel plan of salvation. And that is after hearing God's truth, hearing the gospel, Peter said in Acts 15, 7, that God made choice among us uh, that, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Believe what? That Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. That he lived on this earth, he died, he was buried, resurrected for our sins. Believing that we will repent. Acts 3 and verse 19. Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Repenting we will confess. We will confess what? that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We'll do that with our mouths, Romans 10, 10, after we believe with our hearts. And then we will be baptized. We will be buried with Christ in the watery grave of baptism, and it's for the remission of sins. That's when and where God will, through the blood of Jesus, cleanse me of my sins. There is no such thing in the Bible as praying a sinner's prayer for salvation, anything like that. That's just not in the word of God. I know men try to advocate that. And the one example usually that they try to come up with is the thief on the cross. But a little bit, of, if you just got any Bible knowledge at all, you know that was under the old covenant dispensation and that the new covenant of Christ, until Acts 2, when the Spirit was poured out and men were then baptized into Christ, that, 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 that certainly that could be done that way. Let me, let me ask you a question, then I'll quit. 
You hear loud noise off in the distance. And I say that because we want to look at that one thief on the cross and we want to ignore 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost. And then beyond that, 5,000. So we want, to, we want to run to one thief. Why not run to the 3,000 on Acts chapter 2? There's a loud noise off in the distance. You're standing there. And 3,000 people are running that way. One person is running that way toward the noise. Which one are you going to follow? You heard a loud noise. 3,000 folk are running, screaming that way. One person is going that way. Come on now, tell the truth. Be judgment day honest. 3,000 on the day of Pentecost heard the message to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those that gladly received his word were baptized when? That same day, not two weeks later, Acts 2.41. They were added unto them. Added to what? Verse 47, the Lord added to the church daily those that should be saved. Where were the saved? In the Lord's church. How many did he have? Had only one. And what we're all about is let's just get back to God's way. And if you're here tonight, and you want to obey the gospel, you want to become a member of the body of Christ. When you obey God's word, God adds you to. And here's where you serve and you serve God faithfully all the days of your life. And if you're here today and perhaps along the way, because of the struggles, because of the work of the devil in your life, you begin to turn aside. Maybe you're among those who beginning to drift even away from God's one true way. I hope you'll come back, that you'll rededicate yourself. If you've fallen short of the glory of God, we're here tonight. We can pray together for the fervent effectual prayers of the righteous avails much. Why not make that decision tonight? If you need to respond in a public way, right now as we encourage you through our chosen song, we invite you to come. Six two eight. Six hundred and twenty eight. Sing the first verse. If the name of the Savior is precious to you, if his care has been constant and tender and true, if the light of his presence has brightened your way, oh will you tell of your gladness today. Oh, will you not tell it today? Will you not tell it today? If the Lord of His presence has frightened your way, oh, will you not tell it 
Let's bow together, please. Our God and Father, it's truly been an opportunity to be here tonight to hear more of your word and how your church is to be one, one body, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Help us strive always for that unity of spirit, that unity of truth. And as we leave tonight, we pray your blessing on us, on our family, on those that are suffering from illness or sadness in their family. And may we always be thankful for your blessings and use them in ways that you've intended. Guide us always and forgive us when we fail you and fail others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>